Um, I'll now hand over to Mark Roberts, uh, who is, as I say, one of our regular and much um, admired and applauded lecturers. Mark worked here at the Institute for 30 years, 40 years, yes. a long time. Um, I was our librarian for a very long time and also used to run this program for many, many years. Um, and it's always a pleasure to welcome Mark back for his stories about the goings on in the English colony. Uh, and tonight he's going to tell us about D.H. Lawrence and Norman Douglas. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming, you, uh, those of you in the room and those of you on uh, Zoom. Um, I shall start. On a dark, wet, windy evening in November 1919, I arrived in Florence, having just got back to Italy for the first time since 1914. So the bearded Nottinghamshire miner's son, David Herbert Lawrence, who travelled by ferry to Boulogne and had crossed France by train. In Turin, he took a taxi to Valsalice, just outside the city, where he had arranged to stay with a friend of a friend, none other than Sir Walter Becker, whose marble bust adorns our library. There it is. Um, the shipbuilder and philanthropist had been knighted just three weeks previously. Villa stood inside a gated park, and Lawrence went for a while in its well-appointed hall. It was spacious, comfortable and warm, but somewhat pretentious, rather than the imposing hall into which the heroine suddenly enters on the film, he wrote. I found this photograph, uh, taken in 1908, on an Italian website. At the evening meal, Lawrence was the only man not in a dinner jacket, and he proceeded to go his host with a sincere half-mocking argument in which Sir Walter stood up for security and bank balance and power, I for naked liberty. In the end, he rested safely on his bank balance, I on my nakedness. We hated each other, but with respect. Lawrence left her in after a couple of nights, and to thank the Beckers, he sent them a copy of his Twilight in Italy, the fruit of his pre-war Italian experience, and of his um, autobiographical novel, Sons and Lovers. Becker thought the former a very good book, though I do not see why he named it thus. He thought the latter had some remarkably effective chapters though on the whole, it left, as it were, a bad taste in the mouth. Now, we at the British Institute have every reason to be grateful to Walter Becker, who set us back on our financial feet after we had been hemorrhaging money and had been about to close down. This bust is by the sculptor and composer Pietro Canonica, and was presented by Lady Becker at a solemn commemoration of her late husband in November 1927. After Turin, Lawrence wrote to Lady Cynthia Asquith from Lerici on his way to Florence. I stayed two nights in Turin with English people, Knight, CB, or OB something, Parvenu, etc., Luxury, rather nice people, really. But my stomach, my stomach, it has a bad habit of turning a complete somersault when it finds itself in the wrong element, like a dolphin in the air. The sea is marvelous. Yesterday, a blazing, blazing sun, a lapping Mediterranean, Belletza, the south. The south, the south, let me go south, I must go south. In the south, he thought, the past is so much stronger than the present that one seems remote like the immortals, looking back at the world from their other world. Florence, however, seemed grim and dark and rather awful 
on the cold November evening, which was Wednesday the 19th. Hooded carriages glistened in the rain. From the station of Santa Maria Novella, he headed for Thomas Cook's travel agency in the Via Tornabuoni, where a man was waiting for him from Norman Douglas, giving the name of a pensione in Piazza Mentana. He had written in advance to Douglas, who in these matters was always very reliable. Douglas has never left me in the lurch, said Lawrence. They had known one another from the days of the English Review, where Douglas had been assistant editor and had given Lawrence's a German-style luncheon to celebrate their marriage. Frieda Lawrence liked Douglas because he could speak to her in her native German. But the two men were pleased to discover that they were natural enemies. Lawrence thought Douglas a sybarite with a wood red face and tufted eyebrows, while according to Douglas, Lawrence was peevish and frothy. At the far end of Via Tornabuoni, they reached, he reached the river, which was rushing like a mass of café au lait. Muffled in his coat, with Douglas's note in his pocket, Lawrence made his way upstream along the Lungarno. He had just passed the Ponte Vecchio and was watching the night fall on the swollen river when he saw two men approaching, one tall and portly, the other short and strutting, with a touch of down on his luck about them both. They might have been um, Mephistopheles and Faust or Volpone and Mosca. And Lawrence noted that they were both buttoned up in their overcoats and both had rather curly little hats. At each stride of the tall man, the short man took five little struts. Isn't that lost Douglas in his stentorian voice? Why, of course it is, of course it is. Big and all. Where are you, eh? You got my note? My dear boy, you just palestry, straight ahead, straight ahead. You've got the number. There's a room there for you. We shall be there in half an hour. Oh, let me introduce you to Magnus. So it was on the spot where Dante first spoke to Beatrice, that Lawrence first spoke to Maurice Magnus, and the incongruity did not elude him. Dante had loved Beatrice from afar for nine long years when, walking with her companions on May morning, 1283, she greeted him by the Ponte Vecchio. And in this place, on Easter morning, 1216, Buondelmonte de Buondelmonte was murdered on his way to his wedding, thus precipitating the factional infighting between Guelphs and Ghibellines that led to Dante's exile from his beloved native city. On a dark evening in November 1919 are the first words of Lawrence's memoir of Morris Magnus, which he believed was the best piece of writing as writing that he had ever done. It was published in 1924 as an introduction to Magnus's memoirs of the French Foreign Legion, and it initiated a furious literary altercation or dogfight between Lawrence and Douglas. It may well be a literary masterpiece, but it is curiously unforthcoming, and it reveals almost nothing about their peculiar relationship, or why, as Frieda Lawrence put it, Magnus left her husband so deeply disturbed. There is, for instance, no hint that Magnus was homosexual, which he undoubtedly was. We gather that Lawrence and Magnus spent no more than two weeks in one another's company, that Magnus had a habit of turning up unexpectedly and of borrowing money from Lawrence, and that Lawrence felt he owed Magnus some sort of a debt. The question raised by Lawrence's introduction is the complex nature of that debt. The introduction was begun 
in the Sicilian town of Taumina in November 1921 and was completed in January 1922, the year Joyce's Ulysses of Eliot's The Wasteland, of Mrs. Wolfe's Jacob's Room, and of C.K. Scott Moncrief's translation of the first volume of Proust's A la Recherche du Temps Perdu. The event Lawrence describes had taken place two years previously, but he had an eidetic memory, and the 60 handwritten pages of the manuscript are neat and unblotted. It is not an easy text to classify. It was written as an introduction to a memoir by Magnus, initially entitled Dregs, Experiences of an American in the French Foreign Legion. But to preserve its subject's anonymity, Magnus is referred to throughout as M and Douglas as D. When it was published in 1924, only Lawrence's name appeared on the cover, which read Memoirs of the Foreign Legion by M.M., um, with an introduction by D.H. Lawrence. By him and by many of his critics, it was regarded as the best piece of writing as writing that he had ever produced, which is odd, to say the least of it, because it is by no means well known. It would be safe to say that most readers of D.H. Lawrence have never heard of it. Frances Wilson, in her recent biography of Lawrence entitled Burning Man, illustrates his conflicted response to Magnus as set out in the introduction. He liked Magnus, he hated Magnus. He was attracted to Magnus, he was repelled by Magnus. He pursued Magnus and was pursued by Magnus. He was kind to Magnus, he was cruel to Magnus. Magnus was a hero, Magnus was a villain. Magnus was a clown. We left Lawrence talking to Douglas and Magnus near the Ponte Vecchio. How much does it cost? I asked. D, meaning the room. Oh, my dear fellow, a trifle. Ten francs a day. Third rate, tenth rate, but not bad at the price. Pension terms, of course, everything included except wine. Oh, no, not at all bad for the money, said M. Shall we be moving? Douglas and Magnus were on their way to the post office, and Magnus knew a short cut. He knew all the short cuts in Florence, wrote Lawrence. Afterwards, I discovered that he knew all the short cuts in all the big towns of Europe. Lawrence proceeded to the Pensione Balestri in Piazza Mentana, which had lonely corridors and overlarge furniture but about that he didn't care. The adventure of being back in Florence again after years of war made one indifferent, he said. And in any case, he preferred the Balestri's gloomy Gemütlichkeit to the pretentious splendor of Sir Walter Becker's mansion at Valsalice. In the introduction to Magnus's memoirs, Lawrence described his third floor room at the Balestri as a big lonely, stone comfortless room. But in his letters home, he called it nice. Unlike Lucy Honeychurch, the heroine of Forster's novel, A Room with a View, Lawrence was given a south-facing room with a beautiful view over the Arno, making him feel that he was in a castle with the drawbridge drawn up. In his novel Aaron's Rod of 1922, the eponymous hero is shown into a big bedroom with two beds and a red tile floor, a little dreary as ever. But the sun was just beginning to come in and a lovely view of the river opposite towards the Ponte Vecchio and at the hills with their pines and villas and Virgil. The novelist and critic Francis King comments on this passage it is a perfect evocation of a kind of pensione, Miss Godkins, Miss Plutnets, Madame Jenny Giacchino's, the Jennings Riccioli, the Lavellis Mark, the Bertelli Scott, in which foreign visitors put up in the days before package tours and ensuite facilities. 
When I first came to Florence in 1971, I stayed for a couple of months at the delightfully antiquated Pensione Antica in Via Pandolfini, a vanished world. After settling into his own room, Lawrence went downstairs to Douglas's on the lower floor of the balestri. It was piled high with books and papers and thick with the queer smell of smoke, whiskey and sleep. Norman didn't believe in opening windows because, as he explained, a certain amount of nitrogen is beneficial. Max was already there, resting on the bed. Sit down, sit down, Douglas roared at Lawrence, wheeling up a chair. They were drinking whiskey, which made Magnus's pink face turn yellowish. Norman, by the way, preferred um, Scotch or Irish, but the American Magnus always insisted on bourbon. And in the end, Norman came to like that too. Magnus thought Lawrence was penny pinching and puritanical about money and conversations like this would ensue. Oh, said M. Why, that's the very time to spend money when you've got none. If you've got none, I try to save it. That's been my philosophy all my life. When you've got no money, you may just as well spend it. If you've got a good deal, that's the time to look after it. And then he laughed his queer little laugh, rather squeaky. These were his exact words. Precisely, said Douglas. Spend when you've nothing to spend, my boy. Spend hard then. No, said I, if I can help it, I will never let myself be penniless while I live. I mistrust the world too much. But if you're going to live in fear of the world, said M, what's the point of living at all? Might as well die. Max followed his own advice. And when he was most hard up, he traveled first class and stayed in the very best hotels. Lawrence gives a description of Magnus in his bedroom, a little pontiff in a blue silk dressing gown, moving about with many cut glass and silver top bottles on his dressing table, pomades, powders, and an elegant little prayer book. Magnus was a Catholic convert and a life of St. Benedict. Lawrence noted, all he had was expensive and finicking, thick leather silver studded suitcases standing near the wall, trouser stretcher, all nice, hairbrushes and clothes brush with old ivory backs. Maurice Magnus was born on the 7th of November, 1876 in New York City to a Jewish American father and a beautiful German mother who believed herself to be the illegitimate daughter of Wilhelm I, King of Prussia, and the first German Kaiser. Her death in 1913 was the tragedy of Magnus's life, and he had the words Filia Regis, daughter of the king, carved on the headstone of her grave in the Protestant cemetery in Rome. It, this makes Magnus the first cousin of Kaiser Wilhelm II, who precipitated the First World War. A journalist and theatrical manager, Magnus engaged in all sorts of entrepreneurial business ventures. At one time, he acted as business manager to the famous and beautiful dancer Isadora Duncan, though she claimed he was only her secretary. At another time, he managed the theatrical career of Edward Gordon Craig, um, one of Isadora's many lovers. He served in an escape from the French Foreign Legion. At one stage, he was briefly married. In 1920, he went to Rome and then to Anzio, where he stayed in such an expensive seaside hotel that he had to appeal to Lawrence for money. Lawrence sent him five pounds, and they met each other at the great Benedictine monastery of Monte Cassino, where Magnus was staying, and was indeed hoping to become a monk. Magnus showed Lawrence the manuscript of his memoirs of the French Foreign Legion, entitled Dregs, and he confessed that his check in payment of his Anzio hotel bill had bounced. 
Lawrence thought dregs had literary merit. Though with its many sordid details, it would need heavily expurgating if it was to be published. And he persuaded Magnus to revise it. After Lawrence left the man monastery, disaster struck for Magnus. The master warned him that the police were climbing up one side of the mountain, gave him some money, and strongly advised him to escape down the other side of the mountain. Magnus fled to Taormina, where he begged and implored Lawrence to help him. Lawrence gave him enough money to get him to Malta, where he had friends. If anything happens in the meantime, Magnus wrote to Douglas, look for my grave in the foreigner's cemetery, and I leave all my manuscripts and papers to you and their proceeds. All these events took place while Douglas was in Greece. Magnus felt safe on Malta. He had a little house at an annual rent of five pounds, and he had some friends. But his past was about to catch up with him. On the morning of 4th November, two detectives met him in the street. One of them quite casually went up to him and said very civilly that the inspector of police wished to see him and that he was to go with him to the police station. And in fact, the detectives had a warrant for his arrest and his extradition to Italy. Magnus replied that he would like to dress properly and would then go with them immediately. They accompanied him to his house and allowed him to enter. He locked the door behind him, leaving them outside. A few minutes later, he opened his bedroom window and dropped a letter to a boy in the street addressed to Monte Cassino, asking him to post it. Some time elapsed, and the detectives became restless. They broke open the door and found Magnus lying on his bed in a white linen suit, dying, having taken prussic or hydrocyanic acid. A priest was called, who administered the last rites. A note read, I want to be buried first class. My wife will pay. Lawrence wrote briefly to Douglas, I heard from Don Maurer the other day that Magnus had committed suicide. Today he received the Malta newspaper with a paragraph. He was found in a white suit, dead on his bed, in his room at Notabile, having taken poison. En voilà fini. It rains heavens hard, and I get rather sick of it. We may assume that Lawrence's feelings were too deep for expression in anything other than this flippant way. I shall come back to Morris Magnus. Notabile, by the way, is the Italian name for Medina. From the Pensione Balestri, Lawrence wrote to his friend Cecily Lambert, Here I still sit in my room over the river, which is swept in heavy rain and yellow. The horses and mules, as they cross the bridge, have nice grey bonnets on their heads, and the covers are hidden under big green umbrellas. On they trot in the, the rain, big as ever. Here they all cover the horse's head to keep him warm. I had a wire from Frida. She is coming this day week. Sorry. The travel writer Edward Hutton another of the founders and supporters of the British Institute, introduced Norman to Reggie Turner, seen in this photograph. Oscar Wilde's loyal old friend who had settled in Florence during the Great War. The introduction was a great success, and for two decades, Douglas and Turner maintained a close relationship, one based, as Stanley Weintraub wrote, upon malice, suspicion, jealousy, and the knowledge that each found life vastly more amusing in the company of the other. According to Reggie, Norman was a mixture of a Roman emperor and a Roman cab driver, while Norman thought Reggie rather spinsterish and more suited to handing round tea cakes in Kensington. From the Balestri, Norman sent a note to Reggie in Viale Milton. I have dear 
Lawrence, the white peacock, the rainbow, with me now. Would you care to meet him? If so, let me know, and I will arrange a quiet dinner somewhere. Only we three. I am going to try to prevent his meeting certain other people, because he is a damned observant fellow, and might be so amused by certain aspects of Florentine life as to use it for copy in some book, which would be annoying. These figures of Normans were only too justified. Lawrence spent many evenings in Reggie's company, often in his flat in Viale Milton, or else in the simple restaurants favored by Turner and Douglas, Betty or Cesare, or else Fusi in the Via Condotta. After a while, he left Florence for Venice, but he was back again in the spring of 1921 and checked in to the Pensione Balestri once again. That very day, Rebecca, Reginald Turner and Norman Douglas all lunched together. As Rebecca West wrote later, to each of us, different though we were in type, it seemed of paramount importance that we should go and pay Lawrence our respects at the first possible moment. And she described how the three of them found him in his small room at the balestry, tapping away at a typewriter. Norman Douglas burst out in a great laugh as we went in and asked him if we were already writing an article about the present state of Florence. And Lawrence answered seriously that he was. It was faintly embarrassing because on the doorstep, Douglas had described how on arriving in a town, Lawrence used to go straight from the railway station to his hotel and immediately sit down and hammer out articles about the place, vividly and exhaustively describing the temperament of the people. This seemed obviously a silly thing to do, and here he was doing it. Douglas's laughter rang out louder than ever and malicious as a satyr's. What Lawrence had been tapping away at that day in the Pensione Balestri was the 16th and 17th chapters of his new novel, Aaron's Rod, which came out in June 1922. The two chapters set in Florence contain very recognizable portraits of Norman Douglas, Reginald Turner, and other Florentine expatriates. Norman Douglas appears in Aaron's Rod as the outspoken and hard-drinking Scottish writer James Argyle. Reginald Turner appears as the spinsterish Algy Constable, blinking like a demented owl. Leopold, the brother of Gertrude, appears as Walter Rosen. And the artist Collingwood G, or possibly the con man Maurice Magnus, appears as Louis Me. In Florence, the novel's flute-playing hero, Aaron, goes to an all-male party where these various expatriate characters are assembled. They all snapped and rattled at one another and were rather spiteful, but rather amusing. James Argyle drinks too much and talks offensively in a clever imitation of Norman Douglas's conversational style insulting Algy Constable, who clucks and flaps and blinks. I can imagine that Reggie might have been annoyed at being presented as the, as the butt of Norman's ill humor, but he can hardly have objected to Lawrence's vignette of his entertaining arrangements in the Viale Milton. The next day at Algy's, there was a crowd. Algy had a very pleasant flat indeed, kept more scrupulously neat and finicking than ever any woman's flat was kept. So today, with its bowls of flowers and its pictures and books and old furniture, and algae very nicely dressed, fluttering and blinking, and making really a charming host, it was all very delightful to the little mob of visitors. Um, this photograph is the right period, but the wrong country. It's Weimar, Germany. In uh, 1920, the schoolboy Harold Acton visited Reggie in the Viale Milton, 
and was shown his collection of Max Beerbohm caricatures and his photographs of Oscar Wilde. Harold noted approvingly, his flat is in très bon goût, enjoyed it very much. Indeed, the young Harold liked Reggie a good deal, and in his memoirs he calls him one of the kindest and wittiest of men who never patronized the young. In Aaron's Rod, there is a virtuoso description of Piazza della Signoria, when the protagonist catches sight of the long, slim neck of the Palazzo Vecchio up above in the air. And in another minute, he was passing between the massive buildings out into the Piazza della Signoria. There he stood still and looked about him in real surprise and real joy. The flat, empty square with its stone paving was all wet. The great buildings rose dark. The dark, sheer front of the Palazzo Vecchio went up like a cliff to the battlements, and the slim tower soared dark and hawk-like, crested high above. And at the foot of the cliff stood the great naked David, white and stripped in the wet, white against the dark, warm dark cliff of the building, and near the heavy naked men of Bandinelli. I'm sorry, this slide should be at night time, but I could only find one which was in bright sunlight. Um, Lawrence had gone on ahead with, uh, uh, on ahead of his plump German wife, Frieda von Richthofen, who joined him a few days later. He met her train at four o'clock in the morning and insisted on showing her the city straight away. Outside the station, he had one of the open carriages that were then so cheap and ubiquitous and still exist today, though they're not cheap. Frieda described their nighttime tour of Florence. I saw the pale crouching Duomo and in the thick moon mist, the Giotto Tower disappearing at the top into the sky, the Palazzo Vecchio with Michelangelo's David and all the statues of men we passed. This is a man's town, I said, not like Paris, where all the statues are women. We went along the Lungarno, we passed the Ponte Vecchio in that moonlight night, and ever since, Florence is the most beautiful town to me, the lily town, delicate and flowery. And that person upset by Aaron's rod was our old friend Sir Walter Becker who was astonished and, and outraged to discover in it a description of his visit to my house, a description that was by no means flattering. Becker wrote, the scene was laid in Novara, but the particulars tallied perfectly with the circumstances of his arrival, the features of my entrance gate, lodge and grounds being faithfully reproduced. He also described the conversations at the dinner table and afterwards, all of which, according to him, were on a despicably low intellectual level. Once, Sir Walter himself was presented as a dreadful bore, and not as an amusing jackanapes, as he would have liked. Thus did Lawrence, in his customary fashion, bite the hand that fed him. In August 1921, Lawrence and Frieda were lent a flat at 32 Via de Bardi. On the 1st of September, Lawrence wrote to its owner, Dear Nelly Morrison, I had your letter yesterday. Everything goes well with us. We like your flat more every day. Have all our meals on the terrace when the wind isn't too strong. I find it lovely and cool, and I'm writing a story about Venice. Later, I want to write one about Florence. Modern, of course. Peggy is pretty well, I think. She's not going to die of a broken heart, whatever else she dies of, so don't flatter yourself. Yesterday, Tina gave her a bath on the terrace here in the red trough. She trembled and looked pathetic, but loved all the notice taken of her. Poor Tina has trouble with her teeth, bad inflammation of the lower gums, looks a wreck and feels it. The editor of Lawrence's letters, Harry T. Moore, helpfully points out that Tina was probably Nellie Morrison's maid and Peggy 
a dog. The Lawrences set off on their travels. After Taormina in Sicily, they left for Ceylon, March and April, and Australia, May to August. In the latter country, he worked on his novel Kangaroo. In August, they headed for America to live at Taos, New Mexico. In March 1923, they departed for Mexico City, and he worked on The Plumed Serpent. In November, Lawrence left alone for England, where he was later joined by Frieda. After visits to France and Germany, the Lawrences returned to the US in March 1924, and in February 1926, they were back in Europe on Capri. Annoyed as they might have been for a while about his caricatures of them, the Anglo-Florentines soon forgave Lawrence. And indeed, they were all delighted when he decided to come back to Florence, or rather to Scandici, where he installed himself in the very rustic Villa Miranda in May 1926, and began writing Lady Chatterley's Lover. Though by no means the best of Lawrence's novels, it is probably the most famous, for in 1960, it was the object of a singularly inept prosecution for obscenity by the British Crown. The law under which this foolish and unsuccessful prosecution was brought had been specifically framed to exclude works of literary merit, but that didn't stop the Crown Prosecutor. When I visited the Villa Miranda some 25 years ago, there were hens wandering in and out, and the contadini who lived there showed me some faded decorative frescoes that Lawrence had painted in one of the rooms, which were no better than his other efforts as a painter. I wonder whether they are still there. Uh, according to booking.com, you can rent a double room in it for 110 euros a night. Lawrence was by then mortally ill from the tuberculosis that would kill him before his 45th birthday. He never however, mentioned the disease, about which he was in the deepest of deep denials. While writing his erotic novel, Lawrence would invite his friends over to the Villa Miranda to listen to chapters of it read out loud. He was reading to Reggie, Norman, and Norman's great friend Pino Orioli, the bookseller and publisher of the famous Lungano series. It was Ori who later saw the first edition of Lady Chatterley's Lover through the press of the Tipografia Giuntina. Another person present on this particular evening was, of course, the artist, Collingwood G., who painted this picture from memory after Lawrence's death. I know nothing whatever about Collingwood G., except for the remark of Compton Mackenzie that he was the most completely homosexual man I have ever met. One cannot help thinking that this was a rather odd audience for the great English novel of heterosexual passion. Lawrence was, of course, very serious about sex, whereas Norman and the others were giggly about it. On his visits to Florence, Lawrence was deeply moved by the view from Piazzale Michelangelo. The town lies below and very near. The river winds beneath one under four bridges, disappearing in a curve on the left. And the brown red town spreads out so thick, so intense, so far, one could almost stroke it with the hand. Now it is time to say something about Norman Douglas. He was born in Thuringen in the first. Austria in 1868 and was eight five when his Scottish father, John Sholto Douglas, was killed by a fall in the Austrian Alps. His mother, van der Freyen von Pölnitz, was the daughter of a Prussian baron and granddaughter of James Ockenkar, 17th Lord Forbes. I do not know whether this is really a photograph 
of the infant Douglas, or else some kind of a joke. It is captioned the author in his 1931 book, Paneros, A Study of Aphrodisiacs. When Norman was eight, Vanda remarried and sent him to school at Uppingham in England, which he detested. He completed his education at the Karlsruhe Gymnasium, which was unsupervised and where the schoolboys gambled, drank, and kept mistresses. He then joined the British diplomatic service. His short career ended in St. Petersburg in 1895, when one of his two Russian lovers fell pregnant, the first of many sexual scandals that constellated his existence. Douglas fled to Italy, bought a house in the Bay of Naples, and married his first cousin, whom he came to loathe. By 1904, he was divorced and no longer sexually interested in adults. To his wife's consternation, he won custody of their two sons, Archie and Robin. His family fortunes having collapsed, he worked for the English Review and wrote a series of books, including Siren Land, 1911, about Capri, and Old Calabria, 1915, about the toe of Italy. In 1916, the year his former wife burned to death in a hotel fire, he was arrested for kissing a boy in South Kensington Underground Station and jumped bail. He fled to the Mediterranean. In the following year, his masterpiece, South Wind, was published, a novel about pagan goings-on in Capri, renamed Nepenthe. Douglas is a master of English prose and one of the finest travel writers of the 20th century. Taken together, these two facts should be more than sufficient answer to the question, why should anyone be interested in him? Ian Greenlees, who was director of the British Institute from 1958 to 1980, was a great friend of Douglas's from the early 1930s, and a manuscript he wrote is a good source of information about the older man. Ian recalled, Norman liked to be completely independent and did not want to be troubled with a resident servant. He preferred eating in restaurants. Avoiding hospitality in private houses was almost a fetish with him. If I lunch in a cinquecento villa, my dear, I can hardly send my food back to the kitchen if it is badly cooked, he would say. Can you imagine blank being pleased if I tell him the pasta has been cooked too long or the veal is too tough? No, my dear, it is much better to be free and eat on your own. If I get bored, how can I leave if I am a guest? That is why I make it a rule never to accept invitations to private houses. Ian recalled that Reggie Turner once persuaded Norman to take tea, a beverage and a meal that he detested, at the villa in Fiesley of an English lady who was dying to meet the author of that amusing novel, South Wind. All the way there in the taxi, Norman grumbled. Hardly had he entered his hostess's drawing room than he suddenly remembered a pressing appointment and left. Later, Reggie found him sitting alone in a bar. From the autumn of 1932, Ian Greenies often joined Norman for a meal in one of the simple Florentine restaurants that he favored, such as Fusi in the Via Condotta. Ian wrote, his habit was to head for the inner dining room, choose his table, and then study the menu carefully while exchanging light banter with Pomponio the waiter or with the proprietress whose brother was the chef. Norman would invariably walk into the kitchen, examine what there was to eat, and advise the chef as to how he wanted his pasta and his meat cooked. If the meat was undercooked or tough, if the pasta was not al dente, Norman would raise his voice and tell the waiter it was uneatable and must be sent back. He believed it was your duty to show an interest in what you ate. Otherwise, the proprietor would think you didn't care and serve you with whatever slop he wanted to be rid of. 
when uh, I knew him, even taught and thought a lot about food and spoke approvingly of Norman's views on the subject. But Harold Acton, who liked and admired Norman in other respects, was dismissive of his gastronomic tastes when I once questioned him about them. This illustration is by Renato Guttuso, who had painted Ian's portrait in British Army uniform. It's from the book Italian Food by Elizabeth David, who was a great friend and protege of Norman's. In another of her books, she gives a recipe for pork to taste like wild boar, which she calls Norman's recipe, involving wine vinegar, pine nuts, and chocolate. Here she is in her kitchen in the mid-1950s. There's a certain amount about food in Lawrence's introduction. He describes Norman fussing over a turkey. Look, said Douglas, didn't you say there was to be turkey for dinner? What? Have you been to the kitchen to see what they're doing with it? Yes, said Magnus testily. I forced them to prepare it to roast. With chestnuts? Stuff with chestnuts? said Douglas. They said so, said Magnus. Oh, go down and see that they're doing it. Yes, you've got to keep your eye on them. Got to. The most awful howlers if you don't. You go now and see what they're up to. Douglas used his most irresistible grand manner. It turned out that, in fact, there were no chestnuts. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? cried Douglas. Later we hear him fussing about a hare, which is to be served with truffles and champignons for Magnus's 43rd birthday. Magnus was sent off early in the morning to collect it from the San Lorenzo market. Ian Greenies did not share all of Douglas's um, strong opinions, but he greatly admired him for holding them. He was aware of what we might call Norman's cultural limitations, and in a pamphlet he wrote for the British Com Council in 1957, he noted, Douglas had little knowledge of Italian literature, and in fact, read little Italian poetry and few novels or short stories. Neither was he interested in Italian painting, nor in any kind of painting. Although he lived for many years in Florence, he was prone to dismiss the architecture and pictures there with a contemptuous tone of voice as so much cinquecento. Many other writers have noticed Norman's use of this shorthand term for everything pretentious and meretricious in the worshippers of high Italian culture. Isn't that rather cinquecento, my dear? He said to Nancy Cunard when she suggested going to see some Renaissance art. There is a fine line between robustness of mind and Philistinism. Norman used to say that a good luncheon was worth all the Bonazzo Gozzolis in the world. He did have scientific interests, and in his 20s, he published monographs on such subjects as the herpetology of the Grand Duchy of Baden, the pumice stone industry of the Lippery Islands, and on the Darwinian hypothesis of sexual selection. He also made a collection of London children's street games and another of obscene limericks, complete with a pseudo scholarly notes and a geographical index. Norman's pamphlet, Dear Lawrence and Maurice Magnus, A Plea for Better Manners, was advertised in the TLS on the 21st of January, 1925 and could be obtained from the author, care of Thomas Cook in Via Tornabuoni, for five shillings. In the first fortnight, he sold 500 copies. Its subtitle indicates its scope. As a scholar and a gentleman, Norman is offended rather than angry with the caricatures of himself in Lawrence's introduction and in Aaron's rod. On the other hand, he strongly objects to and refutes the statement that he despised Magnus. This is going too far. In fact, it's sheer bunkum, the novelist touch, 
about which I may have something to say later on. One does not consort with people whom one despises. One does not despise people who show one a thousand kindnesses. In a book called Alone, on page 134, I already spoke of him as that most charming of persons, and I never had occasion to change that opinion. Also untrue is Lawrence's accusation that Magnus had spent over a hundred pounds of borrowed money and had guzzled with it. Norman defends Magnus with examples of his compassion, his generosity, his capacity for hard work, his loyalty and courage, while also admitting that the fussy, finicking, pompous side of his character, shown by Lawrence, is true. The trouble with friend Lawrence is that he has the novelist touch, picking out this or that aspect that suits his purpose while ignoring the rest. Throughout Lawrence's introduction, there is wrong feeling, an inappropriate bitterness, which might have been caused, Norman suggests, by the fact that Magnus had borrowed money from Lawrence. Norman then broadens his attack to condemn Lawrence as a symptom of the times, novelists and journalists writing familiarly about their friends, personality mongering, encouraging the squeaky suburban chuckle, which is characteristic of an age of eunuchs, and spawning a school of cerebral hermaphrodites. As you can see, this is the copy that Norman gave to Edward Hutton, uh, whose son Peter presented it to our library. The ridiculous compilation known as Who's Who has done a good deal towards festering, sorry, fostering this unhealthy interest in the affairs of other people. He snorted. Norman, the scholar and gentleman, evidently felt himself to be above all this, and he regarded it as not only bad literature, but bad breeding. His rampant pedophilia was unknown to the general public. So Douglas had no difficulty in presenting himself as the voice of sweet reason and courteous respectability a writer with whom the English middle-class reader could identify, and a reliable guide to the crazy, anarchic, and, as he appeared to the ignorant, sexually immoral D.H. Lawrence. It was not only the reading public who saw things in this light. The writer and journalist H.M. Tomlinson, for instance, wrote to Norman, Lawrence is a writer who has never got beyond the age of puberty. Some of the silliest trash that has been printed of late is his. Moreover, he is a mean and treacherous man, I should guess, who would do anything that suited him with a confidence. Norman, not greatly to his credit, marked this passage and kept the letter until the end of his life. In the pamphlet, he maintains his polite tone, but in private correspondence, he could be more vicious. Writing to someone he had never even met, he, and evidently still annoyed about the description of his untidy room, he said, Lawrence is all wrong about my room. Ted, obviously untidy. As to my keeping windows shut, I can afford to do so. I haven't got a syphilitico tuberculous throat like he has. Lawrence made um, Magnus out to be a blockhead and a layabout, but Douglas would have none of this. Altogether, he was a far more civilized and multifaceted person than the reader of Lawrence's introduction might be led to expect. He made researches at the Goethe Archive in Weimar on several occasions. I also remember once asking him to write down for me what was worth seeing in Florence beside those monuments and galleries which the unfortunate tourist cannot help seeing. He at once sat down to indict a formidable list of convents, out-of-the-way palaces and private houses where this or that could be seen, many of which I have not heard of to this day and hope to live long enough never to inspect. We not give see that list of Magnuses, I bet it would be far more useful than anything in the travel writings of either Douglas or Lawrence. In order to make Magnus sound more saintly and charitable, Douglas did not mind making himself sound most unsaintly and uncharitable. 
we knew a vulgar creature in Rome whom Magnus one day insisted upon inviting to luncheon for no reason whatever. Why not, he said. That slimy abortion, I asked. Don't invite him to luncheon. Stamp on him. Ah, he said, but one must be kind to these people. If only you knew what he'd been through. And richly deserved it with that face of his. Stamp on him. He'll do you a bad turn whenever he gets the chance. Prophetic utterance. It was precisely this reptile who, through the indiscreet confidence of a friend, was enabled to put the Italian police on his tracks, first at the monastery mentioned by Lawrence, and then in Malta, and so led to his suicide. It is to be hoped that someone has stamped on him by this time. He ought to be pounded into such a jelly that his own mother should have difficulty in recognizing his remains. And these are Norman's thoughts about Mount Morris Magnus's end. Sorry. Um, that foul creature in Rome, whom I have mentioned, set the Italian police on his tracks for a certain debt incurred in Italy. He's talking about the Anzio Hotel bill. If he told me the complete truth, but he was always shy about disclosing his troubles to me. Anyhow, they pounced on him at Malta, and in a moment of supreme weakness, he killed himself rather than fall into their hands. That he was able to face the horrors of life among the unspeakable riffraff of the Legion, and yet was unable to face the slight inconvenience of appearing in an Italian court on a charge of fraud and perhaps doing a month or two, is to me a most inexplicable phenomenon. I suppose he had a queer sense of loyalty, as a, a, a queer sense of honor packed away somewhere, whatever his enemies might say. Lawrence didn't read the pamphlet straight away until he saw it praised in the New Statesman in February 1926 for defending Magnus against his own brilliant but unfair attack. Accordingly, he read it and sent a letter to the editor of the New Statesman. It is time I said a word. One becomes weary of being slandered. And he quotes a letter in which Douglas says, do what you like with the manuscript, pocket all the cash yourself. He defends his own actions and concludes, as for Mr. Douglas, he must gather him help himself halos where he may. Richard Aldington knew both Lawrence and Douglas well. Apropos of their quarrel, he wrote, it is not for me to judge my two friends in this unhappy controversy. Lawrence was not always master of his pen when moved by resentment, and I think it very probable that Norman was right when he said Lawrence misjudged and misrepresented the unhappy Magnus. On the other hand, Norman obviously resented the too vivid and unflattering portrait of himself in Aaron's rod and his charge that Lawrence acted meanly is absurd. This is from a book called P. Norman, which Aldington published in 1954. That's like Lawrence, but he could be appreciative and perceptive about him. He was a man of naturally blithe disposition, full of childlike curiosity. The cause of his mind was unsophisticated. He touched upon the common things of earth with tenderness and grace, like some butterfly poised over a flower. Poised lightly, I mean, with fickle insouciance. This and the following come from Douglas's book, Looking Back, published in two volumes in 1933. Forster called Douglas and Lawrence a doughty pair of combatants, the hunts of whose hitting makes the rest of us feel like a lot of old ladies up in the pavilion. Dear Lawrence and Norman Douglas patched up or patched over their quarrel. Have a pinch of snuff, dearie, boomed Lawrence Norman when they ran into one another. At that meeting, I induced Lawrence to buy several whiskies and sodas for Orioli and myself. The surest way to win his regard was to make him suffer small losses of this kind. But Lawrence had the last laugh. He was leaving for Germany with his wife and invited Orioli to a farewell luncheon. As an afterthought, he invited Douglas as well. The latter wrote, we sat down at midday in a certain restaurant 
Aureoli and myself ordering the simplest dishes in view of Lorenzo's relative impecuniosity. He himself could not make up his mind what to, to eat. He was not particularly hungry that day, and Frieda waited for him to decide. At last, he thought he could marry, manage some fish. They brought for his inspection the usual platter of raw fish, red mullets, and the rest of them. He waved it aside. These small sea beasts with their 10,000 bones were troublesome to deal with. Then the manager himself appeared, bearing an enormous tray in his arms. On it lay a soul, a single soul, a monster, one of the largest I ever saw in Italy. He set it down ceremoniously and observed, this gentleman is no fish. It is a museum piece. It is a wonder. Lucky the client who gets it. Lorenzo fell in love with the museum piece. Frida and he would have that wonder for lunch, or nothing at all. I thought, well, that's going to cost him 50 or 60 francs. Well, it was no affair of mine. This was Lorenzo's luncheon. Let him do as he pleased. The soul took rather a long time to cook, and Lawrence became impatient. At last it arrived, and the two of them devoured what they could with irreverential haste. Lorenzo glanced at his watch. Good God, we're just in the nick of time. Hurry up. I can't pay now, because I've only got a few coppers and a 500 franc note, which they'll never be able to change. We must settle up later. Now, let's rush. You, Douglas, take Frida to the station in a taxi. I'll go with Orioli in another because I must fetch my bags at his place. Norman had to pay for the first taxi and Orioli for the second. The restaurant's bill was just under a hundred francs, equivalent to 10 days at the Balestri. At Santa Maria Novella railway station, as Norman wrote, Lorenzo made himself comfortable in a corner seat with his tweed overcoat thrown about him. No reference was made to the museum piece either then or thereafter, and as the train moved out, I thought to detect, it may have been imagination on my part, the phantom of a smile creeping over his wan face. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. That was a real tour de force. I see I've gone and, slightly uh, over time. Uh, a little bit over time, but it was fascinating to go so deeply into this curious collection of characters. Um, we're going to open up the um, chat now for the, hey there, here's our Zoomers. Um, and um, as always, we now have a bit of time for a question and answer. Uh, if you want to ask a question or make a comment in the room, put your hand up. And if you're on the Zoom, uh, and apologies, Zoomers, for those who had a bad time with the sound, we did what we could, but there was nothing obviously wrong at this end. We will look again and try and make it better next week. Um, but if you want to join in the Zoom, either unmute and talk to us or put something in the chat, and um, I can read it out on your behalf. Um, okay. So, um, anyone want to ask something or say something? <laughs> Stunned silence all around. Here we are. Just let me bring you the microphone. Do you think people are much nicer to each other today? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think they probably are. Mm. Yes. I, I, I mean, I'm interested, Mark, in your, I mean, you never actually met Norman Douglas himself, did you? I uh, know he died the year I was born. Oh, so all right. Uh, okay. Um. So, so Ian knew him as a young man and, yes. and spoke of him from memory yes. rather than more recent times. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. So, um, more questions. Anything on on the chat? No, it's still talking about bad sound. Not bad here in Bath. The sound was good in Bath. That's good. Something. Uh, good. <laughs> but, um. Okay. If we're not, if we have, if we don't, I mean, the lecture was a, a little bit longer than usual, so we can continue the conversation over the wine unless people have got something they particularly would like to raise with Mark. No? 
Anyhow, Zoomers, um, we're going to go and get the wine now. I'm sorry we can't do virtual wine. We haven't figured out how. <laughs> Lovely to have you with us. Um, and I'm, again, sorry for those who had a bad time with the sound. Um, those who did hear it and wanted to um, make a little contribution, was always welcome. Um, so I will put up the link on the chat. Um, and otherwise, we'll see you all next week for Lynn Callison um, on more adventures from the Bardini archives. Um, and if you're in town and want to hear some great music, don't forget, um, we've got the concert tomorrow night as well. And now we'll go and get some uh, beautiful Tenute de l'idée, uh, Les Redenais, Vino Buonissimo, Toscana. Okay, thank you. Thank you.